Okay, so thank you for letting me introduce a small piece of history before everything. So in 2000, the primary governing body for the discipline of phytolith analysis, which is now the International Phytolith Society, recognized the needs for standard, standardization of nomenclature and terminology in the discipline, and subsequently commissioned a committee to draft an international code for phytolith nomenclature. That code, known as ICPN 1.0, was published in the Annals of Botany in 2005. Mm. And as anticipated by the first committee, a decade of use of the code has revealed the need to revise, update, and expand it. And accordingly, in 2014, the IPS commissioned a new committee, which is now named the International Committee for Fighter Taxonomy, with the task of, of updating, revising, and amending the ICPN 1.0. And this work was published in 2019 under the title of ICPN 2.0, still in the Annals of Botany. And this Update version of the ICPN includes revised morphotype names and full descriptions and diagnosed definitions of the 18 morphotypes that were included in, in the ICPN 1.0, plus three others commonly encountered in phytolith assemblage from modern and fossil soils, sediments, and archaeological deposits. ICPN 2.0 also includes an illustrated glossary of common 3D terms, 2D margin outline, surface texture and ornamentation terms for describing phytons. And my purpose in present in present presentation is to highlight some aspect of the ICPN 2.0 the principles for naming and the principles for describing. And let us start for the principles for naming. Each name shall be unique and rather concise, made of three words maximum. And we have a kind of hierarchy in the names. We go from taxonomical names to anatomical names to morphological names. We will be using a taxonomical name when the morphotype can, without any doubt, be attributed to a plant taxa. We will be using an anatomical name when the morphotype can, if, when we do have in fact, absolutely no doubt about its origin in a plant organ or tissue. And we're using morphological name when the morphotype can't be attributed to a unique plant taxa or a unique plant organ or tissue. However, the so well known grass seed casual cells phytolis are an exception to this rule in the sense that their taxonomic and anatomic origin is well known and well established. When published, a name shall be written in small capitals in publication. And in fact, to facilitate data management, each morphotype name shall be given a unique code. These are the principles for naming. And we set together a whole bunch of principles for describing, which I will, in fact, uh, quickly pass through. In fact, you need to know that to be validly published, a morphotype name and code must be accompanied by this rationale, the site and chase description, the anatomical origin, and so on. And let us pass step by step. The rationale for naming shall provide and explain why a new name is given or an established name is retained. It should also include information about why the morphotype deserved a taxonomical and anatomical or a morphological name. The shape description shall include the typical feature of the morphotype, the overall 3D or and or 2D shape, surface, surface texture and ornamentation, 
as to the size, it's the general range of size measurement that were collected. The anatomical origin shall describe in which organ, tissues, and or cell types the morphotype is formed. If the anatomical origin is not known, it should be stated. And for grass silica short cells, a corresponding field of orientation in, in the epidermis shall aid for descriptions of the orientations of the long axis of the morphotype in grass leaf epidermis, of course, if this is known. As to the taxonomic occurrence, it shall describe in which taxa the morphotype is known to occur. Discussion and interpretation shall describe how the morphotypes compare to similar silica bodies by specifying the features that set it apart from others. It should also mention how the morphotype has been interpreted in the past in terms of its taxonomical or ecological affinities in ecological and paleoecological studies. Then the synonyms. The shell contains a list of other names that have previously been given to the morphotype, as well as specific reference to the publication and illustration, wherein the names were given in chronological order. Note that the reference will more likely be not exhaustive. Finally, we do have illustration, that shall include several light microscopic uh, microscope photographs in, in, in order to allow to illustrate the broader range and variations of the morphology or of the surface texture or ornamentation. And not just to illustrate how it goes, I will be go back to one type we described, the elongate dendritic. And we will pass through all the case, the subheading I just presenting. The rationale for naming elongate then dendritic elongate, we go back to the definitions of elongate, which means it fits within, and it refers in fact to the general 2D shape. And dendritic point out the quite major characteristics of the margin of the morphotype. Here you get the description which means that dendritic typically have long protuberances extending laterally away from their longest sites. Much shorter protuberances can also be observed from the shorter opposite ends of the phytolith. And fourth, typically branch, the protuberance can be irregularly shaped and range from dentate to columnar to lanceolate. And then you get info about the surface texture, which range from tilate to nodulate and the length range from 20 to 250 microns. Here it's you get a few info about the anatomical origin and taxonomic occurrences, which, which stress out a few aspects of this faculty, such as where it's formed, in which taxa you find the wild and domesticated species, info about the classifications, Fratricidae and Avenae, the set family, and in fact, also that you can find them as well in other taxa and subfamilies. And we also stress out that this elongated dendritic within the inflorescence of the poaceae formed a morphological continuum with elongated dentate, but also sinuated. And basically, we mentioned also some plant family, some other plant family where you could have some elongated dendritics. As to the discussions and the diagnostic features, which stress again out the most characteristic features, which are the lateral protuberances. We explain how we often found them in our deposits, and basically they are frequently broken. And in some cases, merely in the nearest, they are what we they are articulated and form what we name silica skeleton. And also we would like to stress out that elongated dendritic as usually are usually viewed as deriving from cultivated cereals, but without any other means, they should not a priori be automatically attributed to domestic cereals. Basically, we give here some tips for the interpretation in the observation. Synonyms, uh, all range, we pass through the, the, the old publications. 
And finally, some illustration, basically more light knife microscopy, and this has been an option we adopt as not everybody access SCM or other microscopic facilities. So in conclusion, one should view the ICPN 2.0 as an updating and refining of the ICPN 1.0 that especially focuses on standardizing the naming and describing of phytolit morphotypes and the presentations of the 21 phytolit morphotypes most frequently encountered in assemblage with salt sediments and archaeological deposits. But no one should view the ICPN 2.0 as being an exhaustive and complete codes, as many more morphotypes remain to be described and named. Just for an example, we anticipate that the morphological spectrum encompassed within some of our broadly defined morphotypes, such which are known as bilobate and rondel, will be further on subdivided through the definition and descriptions of more specific, narrowly defined morphotype. Moreover, RCPT doesn't expect everyone will use the exact same glossary terms when attempting to name a new morphotype. But in between, in the wake of the publications of new official names and descriptions, by using the standardized glossary terms along the principle, other researchers are more likely to recognize the same morphotype. But you should also be informed that the ICPT is currently busy with common important morphotype that currently suffer from renaming and synonymy, and that are often found in soil sample, namely those from the dicotyledon leaves. Dicot leaves, apart from grasses, are the main producers of phytolite in soils and the forest. We also plan to update the glossary, and we also expect or anticipate that ICPN 2.0 will likewise be refined and updated in the future as our discipline advances. And that's it. Uh, Thank you very much, Luca. It's, uh, it's always uh, very nice to have uh, clarifications. And, uh, and uh, I guess if anybody got questions again, because we, we have some time, and uh, it could be interesting to, to hear from you. Uh, yes, Jean-Marie. Hi, thanks, Luc, for the. I, it's a new domain for me. Um, I'm not very much. Uh, uh, as you realize, we're interested in images, and you mentioned some images there. What type of images do you have, and are they very big or just to, no, to see no, how they these, can be handled? These are, depending on the people working with it, we have just classical JPEG image. It's the one we, we're taking when we're working on the, on, on the microscope. Uh, we have also uh, all very big uh, DB, online DB, which is based in Barcelona. Uh, fact is also that we, more people have been publishing reference collections for some years, and well, you know, I'm busy with fighters for 30 years, and in terms of image, one of my concern, we would rather be those that were published in the 80s or 90s uh, on CDs. And we have there, there are over uh, all quite wide bench of data that are not really frequently used by, by people, but some are in the Barcelona online uh, DB. But I would say it's classical, it is what well, basically it's classical, classical image. Yeah. Does this answer your, um, your question? Yes, yeah, thanks. And thank, uh, thanks, Zach, for the, for the link. Uh, just uh, curious because uh, to see. Uh, so you don't do, you use the, if I get that right, you use the image more as a reference. You don't do very, announce a lot of image analysis on them or you we go to image analysis when we need to uh, move to other issues um 
one of the most um, I don't know if I could say tricky question, but basically, uh, phytolith are plant microfossils. Uh, and one of the major question you face, it's what about the taxonomical attribution? Basically, we play with, uh, we rely on morphology. But what about uh, discriminating phytoliths deriving from closely uh, closely related taxa. Uh, just if we go to the domestic cereals, how are you going to discriminate Ardeum vulgare from Ardeum morinum, for instance? Or even how are we going to discriminate Ardeum vulgare from Triticum estivum or Triticum durum? And in such case, uh, we move to more quantitative approach. And in such case, yes, we do a uh image process we do pro image processing thank you very much yeah that's very very interesting to discover this new new domain as well yeah. uh, the other aspect is also that there are new um, microscopy we have new tool new research tool coming up i'm thinking on confocal microscopy for instance uh but there you do not look directly on the on the object it's a numerical picture you you're looking at yeah but yeah. In, uh -huh. indeed it, it provides you with a, a 3d yeah. view it's hmm. yeah this is for the type of images we deal with so it's it's like a, mm. okay that's but great. classically classically we we we're working in optical microscopy okay okay thank you very much <laughs>